Hi, I'm Angela. I'm Feldy. And we are going to be talking a little bit about um, syllable circuits, how to use them in your classroom, how to prototype them yourself, and to share that knowledge with your students, uh, whether you're in a maker space, informal environment, self-guided environment, or a traditional classroom. Um, so I'm Feldy. I am a creative technologist here at SparkFun Electronics, and I've been working with Sobel Electronics for several years now. Um, I'm Angela. I am in the product development team here at SparkFun, and I help um, curate the Lilypad line, uh, talk to customers about how they're using products. I do a lot of educational content as well. So let's get started. We have a lot of stuff to share today. Um, you can see we've kind of brought in some of our favorite projects to share. Um, some projects in process, some finished, some teaching tools. Um, let's get a little bit more into what these materials are. Uh, you can see it's not a traditional electronics workspace right here. We've got a lot of soft materials, a lot of fabric, felt, um, drawing utensils. We've got a lot of sewing supplies. Um, so basically we're going to show you how to work with these soft materials, these kind of non-traditional materials, and um, use them to explore circuits and what is the circuit, con conductivity, um, a little bit about these concepts, um, things that you might be exploring with other educational tools that you can really enhance by allowing your students to get creative about how they design their circuits, about what they're going into, investing their time and energy into a project that they can take home, that they can share with their friends and family and their community. And we'll also walk through some of the best practices when working with these materials so that you can have the highest chance of these circuits working quickly um, with as little troubleshooting and issues as possible. So we have a lot of techniques that we figured out through our own work that we want to share with you just to make your life a lot easier. Uh, so let's talk about a uh, simple lily pad circuit. I've got a little one here. Um, we have kind of three basic parts to any circuit that we can talk about uh, with the lily pad system or with any circuit. Uh, we have a battery pack, um, so a power source for our circuit. We have something to use that power. So in this case, we're using a lot of LEDs. They're really easy to implement and to um, use in a project. And then we have our connections here focus a little bit. Um, so instead of traditional wiring, we see um, this thread here, and it looks like a typical sewing thread, but it's actually a conductive thread made out of stainless steel, and that's what we're using to connect this battery pack to the LEDs. Um, so this is kind of the most basic entry level circuit that you can build with a system, and it can get really complex and um, interesting and, and interactive from there, but this is a great place to start. It's just one thing, trying it out, um, hooking it up, getting to know the materials and the techniques because they are very different than just plugging wires into a breadboard. Um, so there are con some constraints there. Um, but you can see some of the bigger projects that we've brought out um, have some light patterns and interaction. We're actually getting into coding um, and using some programming with our projects after we've done the physical connections with the thread. Um, and we definitely recommend also um, starting small because sewable electronics take not only is it a different process, but it's a much slower process than traditional electronics. It's going to take many times more time than it normally would. So you definitely want to start small because it's hard to gauge just how long it's going to take you, especially in your first few projects. Yeah, we see that a lot, um, both when we started out in our personal projects and yeah. when we started out <laughs> teaching, is you've got a grand idea, you've got something really exciting that you want to build, and you don't really take into account how complex that gets when you're hand making a circuit like this. Um, so for example, Feldy is working on a really beautiful cape right now with a lot of LEDs in it. Almost it's, 200. <laughs> it's a very complicated project, yeah. very complex. Um, if that had been her first project, she would have set herself up for failure. I would have. Um, she would have run into so many problems, like powering that many LEDs, just the time it took to stitch them mm -hmm. together, kind yeah. of planning out how you do a circuit on that scale. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of constraints that she was able to um, work through because that had been um, probably, I don't know how many projects she's yeah, done Yeah, it's years that. into my practice. Years so. into her practice. But for somebody who's just starting, and you as a facilitator who's just starting, you don't want to set your students up for something like that where they're running to so many problems that they lose the engagement with the project, they get frustrated, they aren't able to troubleshoot it. So we kind of have brought a little bit of our guided um, practice 
project out to build up those skills one by one. Yes. Um, the first one is a simple circuit, one LED and a battery, and then we can move on to working with LEDs in parallel and adding some more lights to your project. Mm -hmm. Then we can get into using buttons and switches and adding some uh, simple interactivity to a project. And then we can go all the way to uh, programming your project and adding sensors such as light sensors or um, accelerometers, things like that, that once you're confident in the skills to actually put them together in a project, those things become more accessible as you build more and more. Totally. So let's kind of walk through, um, let's do a little bit of hands-on stuff now. We've been let's talking a lot about these projects, we've been showing them. Um, so one of the projects that we recommend with um, LilyPad specifically is starting with this simple circuit. So uh, we have a couple examples of something that hasn't been decorated. This is just a demonstration of how it works. Um, Feldy's got one that's more wearable, so it's kind of a pin that you can attach uh, backing to and put on a shirt. <laughs> this is more of like a decorative Oops, art sorry. piece for a wall, <laughs> so thinking more embroidery versus wearable. And then we have an example in here of one that's actually been customized to have some more decoration. And it's a little bit hidden in here, so one thing that's nice about this technology is you can really embed it into the fabric so it looks like it's right in there. But this isn't a great teaching tool because I can't actually see what's going on under there. So right. we're going to show you the, the simple plain ones and then we're going to show you how you can customize it, how some of our students have customized them and made them really creative and expressive with one simple circuit, one basic circuit and um, really going from there. So what I have up here for everyone viewing at home is a larger version of this and this is actually a tool that we've used quite a bit um, when we teach for spark fun to showcase these sewing techniques in a larger space so if you have a classroom of 30 to 40 people trying to follow along with something let's say this big unless you have a camera really zooming <laughs> in on it this is really difficult and if you've ever tried to teach any crafting or making through a slide presentation that's not going to cut it either no. so um, what we've done is created a big demonstration uh, these are just laminated uh, cardstock um, pictures of the boards that we're going to be using placed in the circuit design that we want to make. And what we're going to do is kind of walk through all the parts of constructing a project with this as a guideline. Uh, we also have a great blog post uh, showing you how to make your own one of these up on SparkFun Education. So it walks you through kind of the constraints of creating these, gives you some downloadable principles that you can use to make your own and kind of through the teaching process. It's a very powerful teaching tool. We highly recommend it. We use it all the time. So let's talk a little bit about what things are in here. So we said that there's battery pack, but each of these have some features that we want to talk about. So we're conducting, we're connecting everything with conductive thread. But how do we actually physically connect those? If you look closely at my big cardboard version and at the boards themselves, if you have some available, there are these little silver holes at different points and they're labeled. You can see there's a positive and a negative on all the boards. Um, those are our connection points for these boards. So they're called sew tabs. And as you can probably infer, we're gonna sew the conductive thread through those to connect things together. Um, every lily pad board has these tabs and they're big enough to accommodate a larger needle. One of the things that we've found that it's really difficult sometimes, especially if you have students who don't really know how to sew. A lot of times when I teach, I'm really excited to have people sew and I'm actually teaching a sewing lesson as well as an electronic lesson because not as many people are doing hand sewing as we used to see when we were schools. growing up. Yeah. Um, so if you have this big enough demonstration, you can also talk a little bit about the simple sewing techniques like a running stitch. Um, you can do some of these tabbed parts and really get that point across. I'm gonna... In addition to our large printouts that we have, I also have some uh, oversized conductor thread. This actually isn't conductive, <laughs> it's but it's a yarn. great stand-in <laughs> for the gray thread that we're gonna be using. And I've got a big needle that isn't super sharp, so I have actually pre-punched the holes in here to help guide us. And I'm gonna just throw a little knot in here 
So as Angela's walking you through this, these are actually specific techniques to use with conductive thread because conductive thread can be a really difficult material to work with. Um, it gets really knotted up. It's sometimes hard to thread your needle. It's hard to make a knot that'll stick. So these are all really useful techniques um, for making it a lot easier for your students to sew successfully um, yeah, without getting frustrated. Let's take a look at this. So here's some conductive thread in a large comb. Um, probably not going to be able to see it too much on the video, but it's actually a stranded thread. So similar to embroidery floss where you've got these different strands. Um, and it does want to come apart at the ends. So you'll see it starting to fray. I can do it with my fake yarn here or my fake thread. So it will just want to start to do some of this situation. Um, you'll have some frays and that's really difficult to get through a needle. Um, and it's not going to be easy to work with. So one thing that we can do both with my yarn here and with my actual conductive thread is take some scissors and kind of cut it at an angle. Um, and that will make a little easy point to stick through a needle. Um, you can also use some beeswax um, if you have it available if you're a quilter or if you want to go to the quilting aisle of a craft store and that will make it a little bit easier. It will smooth down that thread to get it through the needle um, to minimize the tangling that may happen when you're using long lengths of thread. Another thing that we can do to minimize the tangling is not take too much thread at a time. So for me and for this project I want to do probably about two and a half times the length of the stitching um, spacing that I want to do and that will give me a good amount of thread to work with. If it's really, really long, and I can actually make this happen right now, I think, is the instinct with a lot of students and, and people new to crafting is to just get a ton of thread. We're going to have more than we need. We don't want to end up with too little, but we end up with this like kind of big tangling mess. As you're sewing, the more that this tangles, the difficult it's going to be to get um, some good connections. You see I already made a knot happening in here. Um, so we're trying to keep to a smaller project because it minimizes the amount of time you have to stitch and also a smaller amount of thread. Um, the nice thing about conductive thread compared to wires is actually that it's not insulated. So there's no coating on here. If you are working on a project and you run out of thread in your stitch line, you can actually stitch right on top of it and continue the connection. So that is a really good quality to this material. Um, on the flip side of that is once you're done uh, with your circuit, it's uninsulated. So you want to use some insulation techniques to protect it from the elements, from touching other parts of your circuit. So we'll get to that when we're done with our project. So I have a big tangle of mess. I'm going to throw that out. Um, and we're going to start with a nice clean one. No tangles. And I tied a knot in the end. Another thing to note when you're using a larger needle is you want to make sure your knot is big enough so that it doesn't just slide through the holes in your fabric. And this is just kind of best practices for sewing in general. So always try and make sure that you have a big enough knot um, mm -hmm. on there. So let's get started with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect two of the pieces of the lily pad boards together. I'm going to start with the negative. I'm going to walk up these little pre-punch holes to the negative side of our LED, and that's going to be one half of our circuit. Um, I'm going to use the needle to poke through here, pull it all the way. And you can see my knot was not big enough, so it just pulled right through. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and I'm going to make a larger knot here. Happens to the best of us. <laughs> um, but that's a good test. On your first stitch, if it's not going through, then you have an opportunity to adjust. And this is a particularly large needle, so you're probably not going to have this problem. Uh, but now i got a nice big knot here. So I'm poking my needle through. Um, this is personal preference for you, your students, which side you want to poke the needle through. Um, but it's nice to have all these knots. Oops, there we go again. It's nice to have all these knots on the back. Um, that way, if there are any frays or any tails, they won't interfere with um, your circuit or the boards themselves. So you can see, I just kind of tucked it away there on the back. Uh, one other thing when you're planning out a project like this is these are just uh, Velcroed on for my teaching tool, but using a hot glue gun to place these components is going to save you a lot of time and energy. Um, you can, uh, they're not really pinnable in the way that other beads and kind of craft items are. Yeah. So a little dot of hot glue in the middle 
a little dot of hot glue in the middle of the LEDs, uh, making sure not to cover up these holes because sewing through hot glue yeah. is not an easy process. And it'll actually insulate around the conductive tabs that you want to work with. So you just want a tiny bit right in the center and really make sure you don't interfere with your sew tabs. Another thing I've seen classrooms do is use those little sticky dots from the scrapbooking aisle oh, that's to kind of put them on. Um, those don't work great on felt. Um, but they were, will work on other fabrics, um, cotton, and they can just tack them on so that your pieces don't slide around while you're sewing. So you really focus on making these connections uh, electrically and not worry about things moving around on you. Um, yeah. Another good thing to do is use an embroidery hoop to keep that fabric tight while you're sewing. Um, and I think, do you have your zodiac one? Yeah, I do. So Feldy actually built a project and uh, displayed it in the embroidery hoop afterwards. So that's yeah. an option too. All right, so, and um, what's really cool about this example that Angela is showing us is that you can also make a functional small one to go with it, um, which we have right here as well. So let's see those side by side. So while you're showing your students how to sew on the larger hoop, you can also have the actual functioning hoop available to them so they have a really strong idea of what this is going to look like. So back to my giant hoop here. Uh, one other thing, you can see a little bit in this graphic, there's no battery in here. So we never want to sew our circuit live. We don't want to sew it powered. So if I had a battery, it would be set aside, and that's one thing that you can coach your students to do. Um, the one that Feldy was demonstrating was finished, so she put the battery in to try it out. Um, do you want to slide that battery out so you can see? Totally. Right, so we're going to yeah. put that aside, and so if she was going to do any repair work or any additional work on that circuit, she would take the battery out before yeah. doing that. Okay. So I have my conductive thread yarn here, and I've gone through this hole, and now to make a good connection, I'm going to go around the outside of that tab, you can see, and pull that tight. So what we're doing here is we're making an electrical, con eh, electrical connection when we're pulling that conductive thread onto that sew tab. So when the battery is in it, when it's finished, you can see the current will flow through and light up the LED. For now, we're not gonna see anything because this is a demonstration and also it's not powered. We don't wanna do that till the very end. Um, but you can see this is the connection point. And if you notice, it's really wiggly. It's not gonna be easy to get one solid connection out of one stitch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna repeat that same process up through the hole. It doesn't have to be exactly in the same spot as the original stitch, just going through that hole and kind of trapping that tab over here. I'm using it's pretty slowly so you can see as I go, and you can already see like how long this takes to hand construct. It's not yeah. plugging in something, it's not clipping something. We're actually embedding the circuit directly into the fabric, um, which has a little bit more of this kind of handmade process but you can see let's say I didn't I got these two these look good let's try one kind of mistake that I see happen and it's a pretty intuitive one is you're you're just getting in the groove and you're stitching and you're like okay I'm gonna go back in there and you accidentally go around the edge anyone who's done any hand sewing um, has probably had this happen to them once or twice um, or a hundred times <laughs> so now we've got this big loop on our project. That's not really going to work um, because this is actually going to be a live connection when it's powered up. Also, it's really loose and it could touch other things. And at, like third, it doesn't really look great if I have my sewing around the edge. One thing you can do if you see this happening uh, in a project and you catch it early enough is actually just take the needle off. And I didn't mention this when I threaded the needle, but I actually left a tail. So there's always a little bit of a question about do I double the thread over and do uh, a knot to have both yeah. of this, or do I leave a tail? And we both leave a tail in case we get in situations like this, yeah. where we may want to backtrack with our stitching. So now I can just easily work that, pull that back through, mm -hmm. and free that, kind of take a look at where I'm starting at, make sure I'm back on track here. Rethread my needle. Um, you can see it's starting to fray a little bit, but if you use a large enough needle, you, your needle eye, you should be able to get that in there. If it's not working, then you can always trim a little bit, like I showed you earlier, 
get that. The other thing we want to do is make sure we leave enough of a tail. The other thing I see happen is if you're working yeah. away and you just pull the needle, needle right off, of, off. off the tail. So there's a little balancing act of how long you want that tail so it doesn't get trapped in your other stitches and also so that it stays on the needle. So I'm going to have to chop this because I've been working with it a little bit too much. So I'm going to reset that. And get this through. Take a look at where I'm going. And I start in the back, so I'm going to continue back to the front. And these are the kind of mistakes that are what make this kind of work just really labor intensive and slow. I can't emphasize that enough. These will come up. Your students will make these mistakes. And this is the kind of time that you need to build in for while you're working with this. For this particular activity, without all my additional teacher tips in it, we can usually get this done in a classroom setting, kind of following along, probably about 15 minutes. Um, and that is a really powerful activity for one classroom, or for an event where you're constrained, or if you want to make multiple projects in a class, this one is a really good starting because you're not investing so much time. Um, if you look at the, the ones that we have on the table, it's only really about one or two stitches in length um, from one component to the other. So it's a really low time investment for a pretty time intensive kind of craft. That's correct. And then the students can really see right away, like, oh my god, using a needle and thread, I can make something light up, which is incredibly powerful. I'm going to continue on. So I have done about four stitches around here. And what we always recommend is at least three. Four is probably better. Even more is even I better. I do as many as I can. Uh, as you can see, as you do a different amount of tension on each of these stitches, you're going to have some variation. And so doing multiple stitches assures that you're actually stitching a previous stitch down, you're holding it tight. Um, what I do with my students too is I kind of do a wiggle test. So if it's moving too much, then put another stitch in there and make sure that it's really holding it down. And these connections are the most important part of the circuit because this is what's ensuring that the electricity is traveling from the battery to the LED. So these connections really need to be solid. And we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting too yeah. and where we can kind of identify where a problem in your circuit is by mm -hmm. looking at these different sp spaces. So you could start looking at the tabs, looking at the connections um, as you go. And you can uh, learn to really quickly spot those issues with a project and how to fix them. So we've got sew so tabs attached. Um, the next thing we're going to do is continue this stitching to the LED on here and to the negative side of the LED Whoop, over here. Um, one thing that I see happen often with pe uh, people who are used to sewing and used to sewing on a button or some other craft item but not with conductor thread is that you think that the job is done here at the sew tab and you cut it. Mm. Um, <laughs> So if you think about electrically, that's not going to do anything. You're just attaching the tab to itself. So in order to make the connection between them, we have to continue that one line of thread all the way up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it over and see this pathway. Um, for me, I've punched holes so I know where to go. But another thing to do is actually draw out a line to follow um, and put, make a plan from one piece to the other. So you can see in this, because mine are on the same side, uh, it's easy to tell where I'm stitching when I have it flipped over, but when I'm on the back, you can't really tell where to go. Um, so drawing a line here, making a plan will really help. Um, so I'm going to follow my pre-punched holes, but what I'm doing here is a running stitch. So I'm going up a little bit to travel and then back down through the fabric. And every time I do this, I want to really tug on it and make sure that's a tight connection. Um, because we're not only worrying about the connection to the sew tabs, we also don't want any movement or any loose thread on the fabric itself in case it gets um, too close to another mm -hmm. piece of thread that we're using. Yeah. This one is pretty simple and um, you're not really going to run into those issues, but in a complicated project, so let's say maybe that sweatshirt or the constellation, you're actually working with a lot of things pretty close together and mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you plan it so that they're not uh, interacting with each other accidentally. Yes, and um, I often suggest having colored pencils around because you can use those to make traces. Um, the colored pencil will come off the fabric if you rub it a little with a towel or some eraser. Um, I haven't had a problem with pencil staying yeah. on my fabric. Or Taylor's chalk will work really well Taylor's too. Chalk. Color pencils are great because you yeah. can actually color code your connections too. So yeah. for power and ground you can use kind of the standard red and black. Yeah. 
So I'm just going to continue this stitching and now we're back to doing the sew tabs. So we're going to use the same exact technique. I'm going to go up through the tab and around the outside. And you can see once you get the hang of it, now that I'm not talking through it as much, you can do it pretty quickly. Yeah. I'm always going to check and make sure that the stitches are tight and also We've noticed I've been doing is flipping it over as I'm stitching too, because let's say, I'm gonna try and set this up so it tangles. I don't know if I can. I'm actually doing a really good job stitching today, so I'm not having any tangles. But let's say something like this happens. This is my number one mistake that I make. This is my number one issue. You're stitching along and you don't think anything's wrong. You think it's a nice tight stitch, but what's actually happening on the back here is the, this big mess. Chaos. Um, and this, can, this is actually an escapable situation, which not many people think. They get really frustrated. Um, one thing we can do is kind of take a tool, such as another needle, and really carefully pull at this um, to try and release that thread. So, um, this is another thing that comes with practice, too, is kind of identifying when the tingles are starting. If you're watching students yeah. work and you can kind of see uh, that happening, you can catch it before it's too bad. So I'm just working it out here, and then I've been able to reset it and pull it through. I'll fix. If that doesn't work, um, one thing that we mentioned earlier is we can always cut it, cut the thread at that point if you get into a really bad tangle. And uh, start with a new piece. Usually, you want to cut a new piece because you may not be left with enough um, to finish your stitching. And also, once the thread gets tangled, it kind of holds on to this tangled texture and it gets really hard to sew with. It gets toothy a little bit, it gets stuck a lot, so a fresh piece of thread can really help you move along. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to scoot under these stitches that I've already made. And we're going to pick up the connection where we left off. And so I'm going under there and I'm just going to loop around it a few times, pull tight, and that way we can connect the old piece of thread to the new one and then continue on with that. I was pretty close to being done, so I may not have had to do that, but if that happened in, say, the middle of my stitching or in a long leg, um, that's one option. So I'm gonna finish up connecting to my sew tab. So there's three, I'm gonna do four, just because I know I lost a little bit in there with that tangle. And then, we're ready to end this connection. So one other thing I see is often um, the intuition that people have when they're sewing is to just attach all the pieces, which is what you would do with attaching non-conductive um, things such as buttons or beads mm -hmm. to a project. And your instinct may be to continue on. Okay, I'm ready for the next side. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna do these. But what you're actually doing when you skip over that is bypassing your component, so your LED entirely, and just shorting out the battery. So if you good. see this happening, this is not going to work for your circuit. Um, there's another escape plan for this. So let's say uh, I was moving along and sewing. I just got really into the groove, and I didn't realize that I had accidentally sewed across my component. Um, and now I've done too many stitches to do our little escape of moving them backwards. Uh, I can actually go and fix the project by snipping this thread. Fixed. So now <laughs> what we're going to end up with is some parts that want to come out. There's not enough here to tie a knot. So here's where a glue gun really comes in handy, is oh, actually yeah. sealing that down. If these stitches that you had previously were secure enough, then you can actually pick up that, glue it down, save that and you don't have to start a project over again. I think the, the frustration that can happen with handmade projects is that you get so far into the rhythm of working on it that you think that you have to start over, you think you have to abandon your project. But there are these little fixes that you can do, especially on a small project that, like this, where we can learn a lesson about why that wouldn't work in our circuit. We can um, take steps to fix it and we can move on from there. So we've got a little bit of troubleshooting built into the activity. Um, it looks like we have a question. How many LEDs can we attach per battery holder? That will require a little bit of math, actually. So every LED um, has some current draw. 
and we need to actually calculate what battery we're using. So in our case, we're using um, a CR2032 battery. Um, so we look up the capacity of the battery and we look up the um, information on the LEDs and we can kind of calculate where, what's that threshold for both um, the length of time that the ba um, battery will operate the circuit and also how many it can actually power at once. And we have a really great resource on that in um, our learning system called Powering Lilypad LED Projects. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually has uh, the formula and a chart of the most common uh, lily pad LEDs and most common batteries in our catalog so you can quickly reference that if you want to try that out on your own if you don't want to add kind of a math lesson into your activity. Okay. So I'm not going to finish this whole circuit because I think we have the idea now of, of how to connect the components. Um, yeah, I think so. But we would continue this on to the positive to positive. So these are two separate lines of stitching. And then if you look on here, you can see there's actually a little switch on off switch built into this board. So uh, you can actually reserve, reserve some of your battery when you're not using it by turning the circuit off. Um, so I'm gonna put this aside for now. And let's talk about where you go from here. So we've done a simple circuit, we've done one LED. And we're ready to add some more stuff. We're, we're asking questions about how many we can actually put on there. Um, we want to do something a little more creative than just a single point of light. Um, uh, we actually have a second question, which is, can you attach different color LEDs in the circuit? And that's a great question as yes. we move forward um, to this next part. So for the lily pad system, we've actually um, included resistors on each of the LED boards. So uh, they are all kind of dialed in for this uh, three volt battery. So you can mix and match. Um, you don't have to worry about that. And we have, this is uh, Angela's LED um, case. So you can see she has pink, red, yellow, green, blue, purple, and white LEDs. And they're just in here, here they are. So that's a great way to keep an eye on LEDs when you're working in a classroom setting. If people want to choose their own, this is a really great one. Um, and then here you can there's see... There's one actually operating with yeah. multiple colors. You can see they're all about the same brightness because we have um, put the resistors on board for you. Yellow, red, blue, it's great. All the colors. So let's talk about multiple LED projects. So there, that one was actually an example of a lily pad Arduino, so writing some code, which is a little bit further than we want to go as our second project. Totally. Um, so the second project we have to show is this little mask with three LEDs in parallel. So we're learning about parallel circuits. Um, and as you can see on here, it's similarly in kind of a straight line. So what we've been doing is coaching students to really think about um, the aesthetics of their project as well as the circuit design and um, using this mask and having them light all in a straight line uh, gives it makes it a little easier to facilitate as yeah. far as troubleshooting finding errors um, going further from this I've seen students actually take this circuit for, uh, along further and start to put LEDs down cool. along here and then it's just kind of working on how do I get that thread moving around these curves and the design challenge of that without touching any other thread mm -hmm. um, and without kind of overlapping things. Um, and this is a really timely project with Halloween coming up. It's a ton of fun. Um, and speaking of Halloween, um, so this is, this kind of looks, I personally think it's cute, but some people might find it a little boring to just have the LEDs like that. So like we did with the pin, you can actually start to customize and decorate it. So everyone is working in, so let's say a classroom, on the same circuit. If you're all working on a standardized one, um, it makes it easier for a facilitator to troubleshoot. Um, but it does not keep you from being creative because look at all these variations we have on that same simple circuit. So we've got kind of monsters, we've got some superhero situation going on. Ooh, this um, one's fun. Changing the shape <laughs> of the mask itself is, is an option in that case. Um, and we're keeping it structured enough so that we don't have students kind of going off and doing a really elaborate design that then takes your time away from helping other students in the classroom. So we're trying to kind of guide everyone to work at the same level um, until we've got the skills to let them do more of a capstone project. So all of this is to say you can take a very templated, simple, standard project 
and kids will, their imaginations will take them everywhere. So don't feel like this is limiting. Um, a couple of these show some great examples of insulating that conductor thread too. Yeah. So the pin, since it was flat and it was small and it wasn't really going to bend or flex much in wearing it, these masks are a different case. So you're putting it on your face, you're moving it around. There's a potential for them to short circuit if that conductive thread touches itself and a different Crosses part. Crosses on over itself. Um, so the way that we can avoid that is to actually coat it with an insulating material such as um, glitter this glue. Is, yeah, this might puff be paint. puff paint or glitter glue on this one. And you can see that there are these two lines. So the LEDs are hidden under the rhinestones and these lines are the electronic traces. And to make it even more hidden, they added a design element with the same paint. So that it actually looks like it was an intentional part of the design. This is a great example of thinking about how your electronics can actually influence the design of the work people are making. Uh, here's another example, a little bit more time consuming, but um, someone who was really interested in, in taking this embroidery and this handmade thing a little bit further and added all these really beautiful um, embroidery details. And you can see the LEDs are under there and were embroidered over. They're still visible. Um, the traces are again part of the design and then the battery holder and Quite a few of these is hidden by a little piece of felt or a little detail so that you don't see that, but it's still accessible to change the battery and to use that switch. Um, my personal favorites for insulating techniques, of course, hot glue. And the big benefit for hot glue is that it dries right away, so you can really quickly insulate something or secure something down. Um, the challenge is that it's stringy and it can be messy. Um, I also really love puff paint. Um, this takes a lot longer to dry, so that's kind of the challenge here. Um, but if you get clear puff paint or glow in the dark, it's, you don't even see it, which is pretty awesome. And then for smaller projects that are going to hang, I like to use clear nail polish. Uh, this is a really discreet uh, option, but again, it takes a little bit longer to dry and might not be best for kids. So I'd probably stick with uh, the less toxic fume items. Um, another option, which we didn't bring an example of here, is also um, stretchy fabric glue. Mm. And that will work the same as um, kind of the puff paint, and it will dry clear and also flexible for um, projects that need a lot of that flexibility. So if you're making a costume that has something around joints that needs mm. some more um, of that, um, that's actually what we did for this sweatshirt so that you can see the traces, you can see the circuit and you can demonstrate what's going on uh, by using that clear glue. It's still um, easy to see, but it is protected, so if you're wearing it out, it doesn't accidentally short circuit. And on the back of that one, too, is um, some insulation as well, so we always wanna insulate any part that may fold over onto another part of the circuit, so it's both the top and the bottom if you're not covering it with a decoration. So after you experiment with kind of this parallel circuit, adding more LEDs, then you can move on to uh, adding some interactivity. And this is a great one that we use. Um, it's a little plush doll. And so we've got different variations of it. So the one that Feldy has is one with an Arduino in it. So it actually has some programming and some uh, light patterns. And the one that I have is just a simple on off um, using a button. It might be a little hard to see in our lighting here, but you can see I'm using a button to turn on one LED, and I'm using a switch to turn on another set of LEDs. Um, this again is an example of hiding all the stitches, so I put it um, underneath some cool little things, but here's an example of the circuit on a board. So this is another thing that's really powerful in education is to um, start prototyping with these pre-connected boards. Um, as we have already discovered, sewing things together and then trying them out can uh, lead to a lot of frustration. So one of the things that we use quite a bit is this ProtoSnap format. So this is the exact circuit that is in this little plush. Um, so you can experiment with what happens. You can really see the traces on there. You can see those connections. So there's that button that I was talking about. And then we have a switch um, for another part. And what we can do is explore this. Um, these traces here are what we'll be sewing together when we build our project. Uh, so that's a great tool if you want to get started really fast or if you have students who um, may be more confident in their sewing skills and could jump to a project like this rather than starting with a pin. I always recommend starting with a pin no matter what your sewing skill is because it gives you a great introduction to the materials. 
but this is an option for beginners as well. Another thing I wanted to point out is we're showing all these cool projects and showing examples of students' projects. Um, they are, a lot of them are from a guidebook that we've written to walk you through um, four beginner projects to kind of scaffold up this making uh, with electronics. And the first one, as we introduced um, at the beginning, was a pin. And then we went to a mask, then we went to uh, a plush, so we're thinking three-dimensionally. Um, the plush is actually constructed flat and then sewn together once the circuit is functional. That's another consideration um, because trying to work with conductive thread on a three-dimensional form is very tricky. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of spatial reasoning in trying to get things to go around curves, and um, we like to do it flat. Uh, I once tried to do a project on an existing plushie, and it was just a mess. Wires were crossing everywhere, so it gets a lot tougher. So here's some examples. Um, these are downloadable from our website. Um, they're also things that you can work on having students design their own. There's these templates with the pictures of the boards and the plan for the circuits with everything very clearly labeled. So this is the plush. So once this is all together, then you can sew along that seam and stuff it. Um, and we've noticed that this really does speed up the instruction time. It minimizes the frustration and the troubleshooting that you have to do because you can do a quick check of what's going on with the circuit, troubleshoot it before it's three-dimensional. This yeah. is going to be very difficult if I had built and decorated and really stuffed this and then found out something's wrong, I'm going to have to take apart my whole project. Right. So working on a flat surface when you can first, using all this planning, um, we could get, even go a step further and we could start to draw with colored pencils and do colored labeling to really reinforce which parts of the circuit are the positive traces and which are the negative. Um, so this is a really powerful tool and it's something that you could also create yourself if you had a specific design you wanted to implement in your classroom as working a, a graphics program such as Illustrator um, or even Paint or Photoshop and start to place these objects on a template and photocopy it for students to use or to even customize. So if um, I had some students who I mentioned customized the masks and they actually did it on the template before they sewed it together. So here's a template for the mask circuit. And they took their pencils and they actually took some extra LEDs, put them on the paper and kind of planned out how they would approach adding some more along these lines. And that was really great because um, kind of going for it and just stitching and trying to make a circuit as you go um, leaves a lot of room for things to go wrong or unexpected ways that um, you may have encountered a problem that you wouldn't have seen, especially with ones that are going to be worn, is that maybe it doesn't make sense to have an LED right on where my nose is. It's not going to be comfortable. So kind of planning it out in advance really reinforces those concepts. Taking a few minutes up front to do planning is going to save you tons of time afterwards on troubleshooting and issues you'll find later. So definitely emphasize planning, planning, planning first. Um, here's another example of template. Is Here we're, we're getting a little more complicated. You can see there's some more stuff in there and there's a lot more stitching and a lot more places where we need to be strategic about how these are relating to each other. Um, this one uses a pre-programmed controller called the Lily Mini. Um, and you can see up until this point we've really been talking about LEDs and so these are some LEDs in here and this one we have a sensor so we're using a light sensor uh, that's that larger round board in the corner and let's see we'll have a finished project with this so here's an example of one that was built using this template and we'll see if it has a battery in it. There Yay. we go. <laughs> so it's a little banner. Again, we're working flat because as we're learning these techniques and as we're and in a beginner um, space, we want to think three dimensionally after we've been comfortable with materials. But you can get really creative with kind of these flat objects. And you can see there's some hanging on the wall behind us that um, we're using the same idea of a pennant. Um, so this one, you can see all the stitching on the back. And utilizing felt again as a good sturdy medium to work with. 
and then using the decorations and adding a little bit more. So this one has an extra little bit of embroidery on it to show the rocket ship. And that helps to disguise the stitching as well. So you're drying the eye away from the stitching mm -hmm. if that's something that you want to hide. So you have two options is making this circuit invisible and magical or really highlighting kind of the electrical properties of your project and showcasing that. Um, we have another question which is, uh, can I use electric paint instead of conductive thread with lily pad? You can, actually. Um, conductive paint, uh, electric paint, has its own challenges, and the biggest one is actually connecting to those sew tabs. Um, that instance, um, we've seen using a lot of the paint and kind of getting it under and on top of the sew tab will help that connection. But um, it is prone to breaking under cracking. a lot of flexibility and cracking. It so gets you wanna, brittle. You want to use that on a project that's going to stay flat. You don't necessarily like on a canvas, maybe like a painting that you want to have some LEDs in is a great place mm -hmm. for using that. But I probably not on something you're actually going to wear. Wearables, it's trickier. And I have seen um, Bear Conductive has some resources on screen printing with that ink. Oh, nice. Um, so an option there, rather than using the the paint itself as the attachment, is to paint a um, a little round spot, a pad for the lily pad part to go on, and then using the conductive thread oh. as reinforcing those two connection points. That one might give you a little bit more flexibility on a project that needs to have some kind of wear and tear on it. And I just want to go back to something Angela was touching on about using felt for these projects, how it's a sturdy material. A big mistake I made a lot initially was I was buying fabrics that I liked, but they were really flimsy and thin, and they didn't have enough weight to actually hold the components. So it's not just like beginner work that you want to use felt with, it's general. You need this to be a nice, thick, sturdy material because otherwise you're just going to set yourself up for failure again. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, if it is a cotton, you are going to want it to be on a hoop like this or like this to keep it nice and taut because uh, anything else will just fold upon itself and it'll be really tough. Another option if you find if you find or your students find a fabric that's really compelling but it is a little bit more delicate is always to um, explore the option of stitching into the lining so in a sturdier fabric and then using your really compelling fabric over it so that you know, LEDs shine through or components can have holes cut around them to, to work yeah. through that fabric. Um, so I think we're at about five minutes out for us to continue our discussion. So let's kind of jump into, um, we talked a little bit about beginner techniques and, and how to actually make a project. Like where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of what we consider e-sewing, so electronic sewing. There's not really any um, controller or Arduino or code in it. Um, and those are great places to start to explore. And then we can go to um, talking about programming and code through a pre-programmed controller. So I mentioned the Lily Mini very briefly. Um, so these two are the ones I want to highlight. Um, these are some circuits with uh, the Lily Tiny and Lily Twinkle boards. And so they ship with a preloaded code, code. And that's what Feldy is using in her Zodiac constellation. Yeah, they're actually, the animation of the LEDs in these is so compelling. They just twinkle like little, little stars and uh, it's really perfect for this project. So this is a great intermediate step between learning the physical techniques of making the circuit and getting to programming your own. Yeah. So we can make a circuit that's pre-programmed, talk about the behaviors that are happening, the animations, um, talk about electrically what's happening. Um, we can talk about code, but we don't have to write our own code yet because we just hook it up and it starts and we can explore that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a great step if you have um, some time in your classroom or in your space where you want to really emphasize each stage of these building, building these projects. Because what happens, and what I've seen in my own work and what you may have seen yeah. in yours is if you're trying to do both the hardware physical construction and the coding at the same time, it can be overwhelming for someone who's mm -hmm. never experienced these materials before. Yeah. So we're kind of doing these small successes. Um, so we're starting with something 
fun and creative and easy to engage with and really taking ownership of that and being successful and celebrating that and then moving on to the excitement from that gets you to the next stage yeah. in making a project. So we're upping the complexity little by little with these successes and we find that's really powerful in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, especially for students who are invested in the creative part of their project, they're more likely to um, be invested in troubleshooting and trying to get it to work rather than abandoning a project. Um, was they are really excited about the design and their vision for the final project and they want to work through that a little bit more and you can really work out these troubleshooting, um, working out the circuit design, um, frustrations that may have uh, felt a little beyond your skill set when you first start out. Those things become easier and easier as you build in these small concepts as you build the project. Um, we actually have a request which is to see the back of this project. Um, this is an interesting project because there's actually two pieces of fabric on here. There's this back piece of fabric which has my battery holder and my Lily Tiny and on the opposite side of this same fabric are all of my LEDs. So these are the traces that are going to the different LEDs. And then I eventually put a second piece of fabric on top and so these lines. This uh, silver thread is actually not conductive. It's just regular embroidery floss. So it's not interfering with my circuit, but you can see that I actually sewed through the two separate pieces of fabric for the final product to kind of keep everything flush together and in place. So this is what the back looks like. And for this example, I'm actually using just some uh, nail polish, clear nail polish, to insulate and secure my connections. Uh, it's really hard to see in the video, but there it's just like a little bit darker, the fabric around uh, these connections, and that's the uh, nail polish kind of sitting there. Um, do you have any more questions? I think we probably have time for about one more question before we have to wrap up for the hour. So do you have any good ones on that chat window? Or we could talk, we could talk some <laughs> more. Um, Why don't we show them our new proto board? Yeah. Let's, so we're talking about programming, we're talking about programming, but we're not showing the board. <laughs> we didn't have time to do a programming lesson. Maybe we'll do another webinar uh, specifically talking about these concepts. So we just wanted to introduce the system and the making and the technique. Um, here's another one, um, again, wired together. This is the ProtoSnap Plus. And this is it sewn out. Yep. So there it is in action. Here it is um, in its original format. And I'll turn this one on too. Again, it has some example code. Uh, that you can see there are uh, some different colors of LEDs. There are, is a button and a switch, a light sensor, and a buzzer, so you can add some actual sound into your project, um, which probably won't be able to hear too much um, with the way our microphones are set up here, but you can see there's a little buzzer in the middle here. And then this in the middle is the controller, the Lilypad or Arduino, so anyone who's familiar with Arduino, um, this is just a sewable format for that. Um, so it has a USB port to plug into a laptop and mm -hmm. to upload some code with free Arduino software yeah. and experiment. And this is a great way to prototype a project, to prototype with these sensors, to explore, to change the code, to iterate yeah. on your project before snapping it apart and mm -hmm. building it in. So this is actually yeah. something, I'm gonna snap this one apart right now to show you how to do that, um, first I'm gonna take out the battery. Again, we never wanna work on a project when it's powered. Um, so we can actually break this apart. And if there are any little spots left, we can kind of trim those with scissors. So here's the controller. And then some sensors. And like Angela was saying earlier, you always want to prototype your circuit before you sew it, even if it's really simple. So these boards are like an invaluable resource when you're trying something new. I like to have more than one and keep one always together so I can try new things and break another one apart. Um, otherwise, you're going to have alligator clips everywhere and it gets really messy really fast. So this is an unbelievable tool that we really, really encourage you guys to use. Um, you can see if we can get a shot over here. Here's the project that I'm working on. It's not done yet, um, but I'm in the process of planning out where my pieces are going to go. So this is a great um, way to kind of use an existing pattern, an existing project, and then augment it with electronics. So I found this cool little pennant, and I'm going to outline it with LEDs. And then uh, my challenge now is strategically, am I going to place the lily pad Arduino on top? Do I want to place it on the back and make it hidden so I can kind of move the pieces around 
before I'm done with it and then glue them in yeah. place. Um, we mentioned alligator clips. Um, let's show a little bit. So say you want to test a project and you might not have um, a board that comes in a pro stamp format. You're just using components that you have. Um, maybe you bought some LEDs that you wanted to work with. They are uh, easily clipped together. So you do not have to sew them in order to try them out. Um, so you can use these alligator clips and clip onto the sew tabs and make these temporary connections um, that way. Um, it does, if you're making a, a larger project, it does get a little crazy. The more of these clips you put on, it's going to get snarled. But it's great for a simple circuit. So if we wanted to try out maybe this one LED and one battery, we could actually temporarily connect an, an LED and a battery holder together test out the functionality, and then even use that and kind of put them on the project and figure out where you want the lights to shine through, and then um, replace that with a conductive thread when you're done prototyping. It's much easier to unclip something than it is to unsew and resew. so you definitely want to start off here. Um, and we have a great resource uh, specifically about planning a wearables project too. Um, up on our website that kind of walks you through all these different techniques from the templates that we talked about to sketching out your idea to mm -hmm. prototyping with alligator clips all the way through um, insulation techniques and how to protect your project when you're completed with Absolutely. all the stitching. And Angela and I are constantly working on new projects, finding out new tips, tricks, and writing tutorials, writing lessons on our website on the learn page about them. So definitely keep updated there and um, you can always reach out to our customer service with specific questions. Um, we're always happy to hear from you guys and help out and share our experiences about e-sewing because it is a entire world onto itself. Um, also, um, today we just published a blog post talking about educational research around e-textiles, uh, the impact it's having on learning, um, some real stuff out in the field. Uh, and we've highlighted five of our favorite projects uh, that we learned about at a recent conference. So if you want to kind of get into more detail about the research happening with these materials and how it's impacting students, um, that is up on the Spark Fun Education blog. We certainly think it's a very powerful tool. <laughs> Anything else? Last minute questions? that's it for today uh, we'll see you next time we have another webinar coming up next week and we hope you tune in for that thank you guys for joining have a good one <laughs>